Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Minnesota Stormwater Research Spotlights, which is part of the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. My name is Maggie Karshnia, and I will be your moderator for this morning. To start things off, I'm just going to give you a quick background on the research spotlights. The research spotlights are intended to highlight the results from the research projects as they are completed through the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council and the Center. We will hear from two such projects today, just completed this last December. These research spotlights appear with our every other month seminar series brought to us from St. Anthony Falls Laboratory in partnership with the Water Resources Center. The seminar series brings in nationally recognized stormwater experts to talk about key topics. You can learn more about upcoming, upcoming opportunities, about the seminar series and the research spotlights by visiting our website. A quick reminder that all the past seminars and spotlights are available for viewing on the SAFL YouTube channel. You can find these links either on the seminar website or by following the link above. I would also like to take a brief moment to thank our co-leads on this seminar series, Dr. John Gulliver and Dr. Andy Erickson for all of their work and for all of the great support that SAFL has provided for this series since 2019. Um, and just a few quick announcements from the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council and the research program. Um, first and foremost, uh, we have a new RFP out, the 2022 uh, stormwater research RFP is now available. Pre-proposals are required this year and they are due next week by January 28th. If you're interested in this RFP, please visit our website. The link for the RFP is circled in red and you can find all the details there on our website. Also note that both current and completed stormwater research projects can be found on our website in the area circled in green on the screen. There are links to mid-project presentations and final reports and more. Please visit our website to learn more about the research projects. And we do have some upcoming presentations for both our research spotlights and our seminar series. Uh, the next one coming up is on February 24th. Uh, David McCarthy from Monash University in Australia will be pre presenting. Um, his work has focused on identifying pollutants in stormwater and also the harvesting and reuse of stormwater. On March 17th, we'll have a, another research spotlight featuring Ryan No. His research project aims to equip local governments with accessible, relevant climate change data. And then on April 21st, we'll hear from Harry Zhang. Um, he'll be talking about using tools and analysis to advance green infrastructure practices. So again, you can find all this information on our website, so look there for more information. And that brings us to today's research spotlights. We'll be featuring two recently completed projects funded by the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council and the Center's Stormwater Program. First, we're going to be hearing from Satoshi Ishii, who will talk about contaminant removals and stormwater reuse systems. Then we'll take a brief five-minute stretch break. And then when we come back, we'll be hearing from Todd Shoemaker, who will talk about the effectiveness of underground filtration systems. By the way, both of these research projects were identified as high priority by the Minnesota Stormwater Research Roadmap. And both of these projects are part two of earlier projects that were funded by the Council and the Center, where they found that further critical research was definitely needed. So it's going to be pretty exciting for all of us to hear of their results. Uh, and a quick reminder while they're presenting, you can use the Q&A panel to submit or ask your questions. Um, and if you see another question that you think is a, a great one that you'd like to see answered, please give it a thumbs up. The more thumbs up we get on a question, the higher it rises um, on the list, and then we'll answer those questions that are most popular first. So be sure to do that. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Satoshi Ishii. He is an associate professor in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate, as well as the Biotechnology Institute at the University of Minnesota. Prior to joining the university in 2015, he was the assistant professor in the Division of Environmental Engineering in Hokkaido University in Japan. The goal of his current research is to solve key environmental problems by applying micro microbiology and biotechnology approaches. 
Today, he will be presenting on the results of his recent research project through the council, which focuses on contaminants in stormwater reuse systems. And with that, Satoshi, I will let you take it away. Okay, thank you, thank you for the introduction. And my name is Satoshi Ishii. I'm at the I'm at the I'm at the University of Minnesota. I'm presenting on behalf of the research team shown in this slide. And this project was done in collaboration with the Minnesota Department of Health. But please note that the uh, um, results, conclusions, and recommendations presented here do not necessarily reflect their opinion. Uh, probably I don't need to explain the background of this project to this audience, but uh, please let me do just briefly. As you know that uh, there is an increasing demand for water, but there is a limited water resources, both surface and groundwater resources. To meet this demand, reusing water can be a good an, an, an alternative approach. In order to do that, uh, we will need to treat or, may, or some, sometimes un, untreat, untreated rainwater, stormwater, or wastewater for various purposes, such as groundwater recharge, irrigation, co-washing, grid flushing, etc. This practice can uh, conserve water resources as well as improve surface water quality. I, however, we are still not sure if, if, if there is any pathogens present in the reclaimed water. And we are also not sure what reclamation processes are most effective to remove microbial contaminants. To answer these questions, we have conducted several uh, water reuse projects. First one was funded by HCCMR, and we collected sample. Uh, we collected samples from various reuse facilities throughout Minnesota, and we collected two to three something, two to three samples per site. And this, the, the main purpose of this project was to obtain the overview of the Minnesota's reuse status and quality. And this is what we found. Um, we collected uh, samples across states, mostly in the Twin Cities metro areas and also the rivers. We found that stormwater and rainwater are the main source of uh, main source of water reuse. The blue is the stormwater and the light green is for rainwater. We also found that coarse filtration is commonly used, as shown in this brown pie. And also uh, UV and chlorinations are also um, used, but less common compared to coarse filtration. UV filtration is shown in orange, and uh, chlorination is shown in yellow pies. We also found that the uh, main purpose of re water reuse is irrigation as shown in this gray pie. So this, so, so this LCCMR funded project gave an overview of the Nesta water use status. Then we continued, we, we did more focused research, which is funded by Minnesota Stormwater Research Council. The purpose of this research was to focus more on stormwater reuse because that is, because stormwater is most, <laughs> most uh, frequently used source. And we try to uh, see the impact of environment, environmental conditions such as precipitation on the occurrence of pathogens. So we did more intensive sampling at three to four reuse facilities. And we analyzed the temporal dynamics. The summary of the MSRC phase one research was that the precipitation could influence stability and the occurrences of E. coli and antibiotic resistance genes. But this trend is site or system dependent. 
This may be related to our sampling method. We collected water samples uh, during the daytime. At that time, water, uh, water was stagnant. And the sampling was not always after a storm event. Another, uh, find, uh, uh, another conclusion of this phase one research was that water quality at the Ramsey County site was comparable to tap water control. So this table shows the five uh, sampling locations and Ramsey County site has the most extensive treatment, including vortex, bark and charcoal filtration and UV, UV disinfection. This is most likely related to their, to their reuse purposes. They use the reclaimed, reclaimed water for toilet flushing. So the number of uh, genes, gene copy detected is lower than the Aston motor reuse facilities and comparable to tap water con control. But this research was done by using quantitative PCR, which is DNA-based um, gene detection approach. So qPCR is useful, but it can also detect bacteria. Uh, it can also detect dead cells present in environment. So that is one of the limitations of the phase one research. So there are several unanswered questions, including did QPCR detect dead microbes? How were pathogens, antibiotic resistance genes removed by treatment systems? And we are not we we did we didn't measure the nutrient levels from these sites. So we don't know how well nutrients were removed. Also, we don't know the cost for reuse. So to answer these questions, we proposed uh, another research, phase two. Unfortunately, it was selected for funding. So that is what I'm going to present today. So the objectives of the phase two research is to intensively monitor levels of microbial and nutrient contaminants in source and reclaimed stormwater samples when the system is up and running. And two, examine how well these contaminants are removed by stormwater reuse practices. And then to analyze cost for water reuse. Through this research, we, wanted, we want to contribute to the establishment of safe and efficient reuse of Minnesota's stormwater. We collected from two stormwater reuse sites located in Carver County and Washington County. And also we collected two different sites that uses lake water and city water for irrigation. All sites, all, all water is used for irrigation. A stormwater reuse site in Cover County uses coarse sand filtration and chlorination, whereas stormwater reuse site in Washington County uses coarse sand filtration and UV disinfection. So this is the de more detailed information about the Cover County site. They collected uh, stormwater in a pond from which they take water and and store in a wet well. And then they uh, inject chlorine there. After that, uh, pass through a sand filtration and use for irrigation. We collected samples from four locations within the site. Pond, wet well, post treatment, post, post filtration, and the application site. And we collected three samples on the same day. In, so this was done to see if there is any uh, 
variation within the day, or if there is any flush of bacteria or any growth of bacteria within the di distribution system. We collected samples in June and August 2020. This is a site description at Washington County site. They collected water, stormwater in pond from which they uh, pass they they pass water through sand filtration, and then after that uh, disinfect water by UV used for irrigation. We collected samples from three locations: post filter, post UV, and application site. Uh, we collected samples. We collected four samples at each location per visit. And we collected in June and August 2020. As a control, we collected lake water samples that is used for irrigation and also city water control that is used for uh, irrigation. Again, two sampling, two, uh, two, two to three sample samples were collected at each location per visit. Uh, water samples were filtered through a membrane, and, and the co contents collected on the membrane were backcrushed and used for DNA and RNA extractions. These DNA and RNA are used to quantify bacteria and viral pathogens, as well as antibiotic resistance genes by using high throughput multi-pathogen quantification tool. The water samples were also used to measure temperature, pH, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, suspended solid concentrations, chlorine, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, total organic carbon, and E. coli. E. coli was measured by Collidat method. That means uh, E. coli measured in this study are uh, based on uh, culture-based method. Whereas pathogen and ARG measured are uh, DNA-based method. It is culture-independent. Uh, target bacteria uh, includes, uh, sorry, target pathogens include bacteria, such as E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Legionella, and viruses, such as noroviruses, adenoviruses, and also antibiotics and metal resistance genes. As I mentioned before, that PCR-based method can detect dead cells. But there is a method called property monoazide treatment to discriminate dead and live cells. Basically, the, the dye binds to the DNA of dead cells. And the dye-bound DNA will, be, will not be used for QPCR. Therefore, we can amplify, we, we can detect the DNA only from the live cells. Dye cannot penetrate through the membrane of the live cells. That's why we can only detect live cells. We did the QPCR with PMA treatment to, to detect live, live, live microbes. And also we did QPCR without PMA treatment to detect both live and dead microbes. Okay, so here we sh I show the results of the overview of the gene detections. We detected 15 to 35 different antibiotic resistant genes, ARGs, and pathogens. ARGs were more frequently detected than pathogens, and than, than pathogenic bacteria and viruses. Uh, Enteropathogenic E. coli and human adenoviruses were relatively frequently detected across samples. As you can see, also the Washington County site has lower number of 
directions that cover these sites and lake water sites. And the levels of uh, uh, gene detection is comparable to city water at Washington County site. Um, we collected multiple samples on the same day, but we didn't see, see significant difference in the pathogen and ARG concentrations between samples collected on the same day. Therefore, we treated these samples as a replicate for, for the analysis. In terms of PMA to discriminate between live and dead microbes, uh, viral pathogens were de detected only from the PMA treated samples. That means uh, viruses were vi 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 uh, viruses we detected in this study were most likely uh, dead or damaged. For bacteria, there is a, a positive strong correlation between PMA treated cell count and PMA and PMA untreated quantities. And the slope is close to the y equals x line, which is shown in dot in the dotted line here. So, so that means that um, live cells quantities are similar to the total cells. So that, so that means most cells we detected for bacteria are alive. We also see the correlation between uh, environmental variables. Strongly positive correlations were found between, gene, between the number of genes detected and the 24-hour precipitation and between conductivity and 48-hour precipitation. Strongly negative correlations were detected between dissolved oxygen and 48-hour precipitation. So precipitation influences uh, water chemistry as well as the number of genes detected. So here I show the um, number of uh, pathogen and ARGs in cover county sites. Since we have lots of data, I show this as a heat map. So lighter color, like yellowish cells, indicate a more abundant genes. And blue or green, green or blue cells indicate their concentrations are lower. So we detected um, many ARGs, including SAR1 and MER1. So, so most of these genes are antibiotic resistance genes. Pathogen genes are occasionally detected, but not very frequent. I would say um, sporadic. The pattern of ARG profiles are clustered by sampling date. The June samples were uh, clustered toward the left of this heat map and August samples are clustered on the right side of the heat map. Uh, total pathogen and ARG concentrations were significantly different between pond and the other samples. As you can see that the pond samples have more yellowish cells, more, more, more yellowish cells as compared to other cells. This table shows the nutrient levels and E. coli concentrations in the samples. The levels of cultivable E. coli decreased by chlorination and filtration treatment. Uh, they chlorinated in wet weather. And after that, the concentration decreased from over uh, 1,700 to about 1,000. And filtration also far further decreased the number of E. coli cells. 
the levels of nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon were all relatively low and did not change by treatment. This is the uh, heat map for pathogen and ARG at Washington County site. Similar to the Kaba County sites, the gene detection profiles were clustered by date, by month, June and August. And post UV and application samples had smaller number of gene detection than post filter samples. So we collected uh, three different types of samples, post filter, post UV, and application sites. So uh, application samples. And you can see there are more green, uh, sorry, yellowish cells for post filter samples as compared to other samples. So this, that means more, uh, higher number of genes are detected in these samples. This shows the uh, nutrient levels in Washington County sites. Similar to the Cover County sites, the uh, nutrient concentrations were all low and did not change by treatment. Also, levels of culture, culture E. coli decreased by, by UV. So sorry, it e, e, e is not coronation, by UV. And it became almost zero after post-UV treatment. And just for comparison, this is, this, this table shows the nutrient and E. coli level in lake water control and, and city water control samples. Um, lake water still contains relatively high levels of E. coli, but the nutrient levels are low. Uh, city water control did not have any E. coli because city water must meet the drinking water standards. Then we also analyzed the annual running cost for Carver County and Washington County and city water control. We couldn't obtain enough information for lake water control sites, therefore, we didn't include the lake water sites for this analysis. Um, Washington County site is still under warranty, therefore has lower repair and maintenance cost here. But overall, the, the uh, stormwater reuse sites has lower annual running cost as compared to city water control sites. So for, to, to conclude the phase two research, uh, various ARGs were detected in stormwater samples. Many of them were also detected in lake water control and city water control samples. Uh, since ARGs are naturally present in various bacteria, including both pathogens and non-pathogens, non detection of ARGs does not necessarily uh, raise public health concerns. Several viral pathogens were detected, but they are most likely inactive or damaged, and therefore not infectious. Thus, system with UV treatment did a better job in inactivating E. coli and pathogenic, uh, pathogens and ARGs. But please note that the sites we use, uh, the, the cover county sites which uses chlorination, um, they inoculated chlorine before filtration. Therefore, part of the chlorine may have reacted with organics and sediments that were not yet removed by filtration. To improve the disinfection dis performance, it may be uh, more effective if they inject chlorine after filtration. 
The levels of nutrients were generally low in the stormwater samples collected in this study. Running costs at the two stormwater reuse facilities were both cheaper than the irrigation facility that uses city water. Overall conclusion of the, of the phase one and phase two research are that using treated stormwater for non-portable purposes, such as irrigation, could be reasonably safe and sustainable alternative practice that is comparable to using lake or city water. Stormwater reuse can be economically beneficial and environmentally friendly. And stormwater reuse facilities should be carefully designed to maximize the removal efficiency of potential um, contaminants. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the stormwater reuse facilities that allow us to collect uh, samples and also stormwater, or also Minister Stormwater Research Council and, the, uh, and their partners. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Satoshi. Uh, that was a great research project uh, presentation and I see we do have a few questions coming in. So just a reminder to everybody that if you have questions, please submit them now in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, and then if you like one of the questions that was asked, please give it a thumbs up and it'll make it float to the top. Um, so the, our first question is from John Gulliver. Um, he asks, uh, the PMA treated cells were greater than untreated cells. It looks like a half order of magnitude. Can you explain how this is possible? Yes, so yeah, John is correct. So sometimes we see higher, con higher gene concentration in uh, PMA treated cells. So PMA treated cells reflect the live cells and untreated samples reflect live and dead cells. So it should, so PMA treated cells theoretically have smaller number of uh, gene concentrations than untreated cells. But occasionally we see greater concentration in PMA treated samples. This is probably because of the variation uh, generated by PCR, I mean, Q, uh, quantitative PCR. Uh, quantitative, quantitative PCR has relatively large variation and two order of magnitude is frequently seen. Great, right, thank you. Um, next question is, can you explain the zero labor costs for the Washington County site? Yes, so we asked for the cost for each site and we used those for calculation. So Washington County site is still under warranty so they don't have to uh, pay for repair and or something happened. And for the labor cost, um, I don't, I'm not sure why they, um, they say no labor cost. Probably the maintenance is included in the warranty, but I really need to check with them. Thank you, Satoshi. All right, welcome back to the research spotlight. We're gonna jump right in and I'd like to introduce our second presenter, Todd Shoemaker. Todd has 20 years of experience in the water resources and environmental engineering field. And he currently serves as a senior water resource engineer at Stantec. His primary interests include watershed and stormwater management, green stormwater infrastructure modeling and design, water quality moder monitoring, um, ravines and stream bank stabilization and floodplain management and regulation. Today, he'll be presenting the results of his recent research project with the council on the effectiveness of underground filtration systems. Uh, and with that, Todd, I will let you take it away. Hey, thank you, Maggie. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Appreciate being here. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to share the uh, results of our research. So I'll be uh, 
presenting here on our the results of our monitoring study of pollutant removal and maintenance of underground sand filters. So let's jump right into it. I'll give you a quick introduction on, uh, I guess, a little background on uh, what we're doing, why we did it, talk about the sites that we selected, spend most of the time on our data collection and analysis, offer our conclusions and recommendations, and then give some time for questions at the end. Only easy ones, though. Let's all agree to that, please. Thank you. So let's get kicked off here with background. So uh, why are we doing this? We've seen uh, an increase in the popularity, the implementation, the construction of underground sand filters over the last decade or so. Uh, that's because uh, there, there's an increased focus on stormwater management, especially in urban sites. Uh, as urban sites redevelop, there's generally more impervious, more parking lot, uh, or there's a shared use where there's a green space, park, turf field, something like that. On the surface, and we want to do, we want to push stormwater management underground. Well, the underground sand filter comes into play when, when you need to do this on a site with where you can't infiltrate, either due to poor soils or contaminated soils. The um, the question with these sites, I guess, is that they are indeed underground. Uh, sometimes uh, there is no direct maintenance access to the sand filter. And the, the design guidance for these underground systems, I guess, in my opinion, is generally borrowed from surface sand filters in Minnesota stormwater management. And then lastly is after these are constructed, um, I would guess that, that site owners probably, you know, to some degree, they may forget about them. They're out of sight, they're out of mind. So this is a way for us to evaluate the performance uh, of, these, of these underground sand filters. So quick intro here on the, the types of systems that we looked at. There are two, here's a pipe system. Uh, this, generally the pipes are made of steel or plastic, they're perforated. Uh, they allow for a flexible uh, site alignment or layout where they can be square, rectangular, or even sometimes in an L shape. The design below the pipes, so we got the, the storage pipe here and then some usually clear or clean rock around it. So this is our storage system. Water uh, from the parking lot, roof, whatever it might be, runoff water enters the storage pipe, the storage system through a storm sewer system. This arrow is not to imply that there is water coming in entering the system from the top. That's uh, water enters the system through a storm sewer, uh, storm sewer pipes. Then it migrates downward through the sand filter layer to a drain tile system that then is plumbed downstream. This layer down here below the pipes, that design seems to vary both in the, the sand or the filter material, the depth, this drain tile diameter and even the material that surrounds the drain tile. The other type of system that we looked at is a chamber system, very similar to the, the pipe system, but it, it, the, the chambers generally have an open bottom uh, and they allow the use of the chamber system is usually more beneficial for designers on sites with shallower excavate, or shallow excavation or they're limited by uh, the fall across the site or connecting to an external storm sewer system. Uh, plumbing works generally the same here is that you have you collect surface runoff in a storm sewer system that those storm sewer pipes are connected to the chambers water flows in uh, moves down through the system through the sand filter and gets collected by the drain tile. Let's talk about site selection. So we looked at uh, dozens of potential sites to look uh, to, to monitor. We ended up with six. Uh, mainly those were selected because uh, either we could not get permission from other identified sites or even a couple where we got permission, we could not actually monitor, we could not sample those sites because uh, of limited access. So we could not get to the, 
the bottom, the invert of the storage system. And we could also not, uh, I guess, interpret the bottom by using an adjacent manhole. So the, the, the manhole invert adjacent to that system was higher. So then we could not drop a pressure transducer in there to essentially monitor the, the water level in the system. So the, that, was, that was frustrating, but still, I guess you'll see that come back in, in our recommendations. Uh, in terms of the six sites, uh, we've used these generic uh, site names to uh, attempt to maintain anonymity for the six site owners. Our six sites range from 0.9 to 2.3 acres, uh, 43 to 100% impervious. There's four pipe systems and two chambers. So I'm going to move through these relatively quickly. Uh, parking lot, this is our oldest of the six systems, 100% impervious. This is a chamber system. And as we reached out to the site owner, probably in the last four or five months, something like that, we did not get a response from them on whether any maintenance had been uh, uh, performed on it. School site is constructed in 2018. This is a pipe system. You can see there's a much broader mix of land use here with roof, parking lot, and playground, and even uh, turf. 66% impervious and also no response on whether any maintenance has occurred here. The office site constructed in 2016, 100% uh, impervious, 96 inch perforated metal pipe. This one, there's two interesting uh, differences here on this site. Uh, if you can follow my cursor, there is a bioretention basin on this side to the, the right of the parking lot. And then there is also a pervious pavement up here. And the dra drainage pattern here, actually these two BMPs provide a little bit of uh, treatment before the pipe system. So runoff flows to the east into the bioretention. That then gets piped around underneath pervious pavement to this inlet. And then there's the kind of the final treatment, final management within the pipe system. Further, this system is described in the site plans as filtration, but it's notable that they're that really the filter is angular wash stone. And again, no response on whether any maintenance has been conducted here. Uh, the animal site, uh, this one along with the next two uh, that, you, that you'll see were all constructed in 2017. So this has our largest drainage area, 43% impervious is a perforated pipe. And the maintenance uh, here is that it occurs two, they sweep the parking lot in that little drive area two times annually, and they did remove sediment from the treatment structure in 2019. Uh, medical site is uh, part driveway and part parking ramp, 1.6 acres, perforated metal pipe. Uh, this site had the most uh, elaborate maintenance plan, I would say, that there, there, I guess there is in fact a, a specific plan. Uh, that was prepared by the, the site designer. The owner conducts annual sweeping, the designer conducts annual inspections for the owner and then prepares a report. The 21 report recommended cleaning of the pretreatment system, so that will occur uh, in 2022. Our last of the six sites is apartment, also constructed in 2017. Uh, and it is a chamber system with uh, no response on if any maintenance has occurred. Let's dive into the data. So in terms of monitoring and what we sample, these are the five pollutants that we sampled. Uh, just real quick refresher on the, the middle three there. So total phosphorus, uh, consists of on a, on a basic level, there's particulate phosphorus and then dissolved phosphorus. Then if I move to the middle sheet there, the dissolved phosphorus, that one of the, the, the constituents, the parts of that total dissolved phosphorus is orthophosphate. That is the piece of the total dissolved that is most readily available for algae. So that is why that 
kind of the, those how those three get broken down into um, what's at least one the orthophosphate that oftentimes is critical for our downstream water bodies. Sample collection. So we collected samples uh, uh, using grab samples. We targeted rainfalls that were 0.1 inches per hour intensity or larger, and trying to time best as we could our site visit and sampling with the storm event and, uh, and radar. So a uh, huge shout out to Allie Stone, who is the, the, the prime uh, person doing the sampling. Uh, she did a great job tracking the forecast radar and uh, sampling on some evenings and weekends. So Allie, I think you're on the call. Thanks a lot for that. We sampled a total of 20 storms over 20 and 21. Uh, those rainfall depths range from 0.2 to 1.75 inches. And water levels within each of the six systems, those were uh, recorded using a, pressure, a rugged troll pressure transducer. Within those, uh, amongst those six sites, uh, those were in the Twin Cities here. And we located uh, two barrow trolls kind of uh, trying to be as equidistant as we could between the sites so as to correct for barometric pressure. Excuse me. Uh, before we jump into the data, a real quick uh, refresher on box and whisker plots. Uh, you'll see the, the next several slides are uh, just, we're just going to we're going to kill it on box and whisker plots. So if you're afraid, if you didn't sleep well last night, now is a good time for a nap. Come back in five, 10 minutes, all rested and ready for the conclusions. So our the box and whisker here, you can see um, the rain. Th this presents the, the, the spread of the data collected along with the skewness. We're going to talk a lot about the the range, so the it's the interquartile range between this 25th and 75th percentile, and then also a lot about the median. You'll also see uh, on a fair, I don't know, maybe not a fair amount of samples, but there was a decent number of outliers that, that we recorded as well. So this is uh, total suspended solids. The blue boxes, towards the bottom is influent, and then the red is effluent. The dashed lines show the expected range of influent concentration from the Minnesota stormwater map. So in terms of influent, we had uh, three, maybe four-ish sites that were in the expected range from the MSM. Effluent, we were, there's the, the, the dashed lines again in terms of what would be expected from the manual. We had two, maybe three sites that were in the range and three sites that were below. Uh, as we move through these slides, I also want you to pay attention to the median at these sites. So let's look at apartment, for example. The median influent is here. That's that, the solid line, it's kind of collinear with the expected. And then if you look at the median effluent, that's up here. So on apartment one, two, three, four sites, so apartment, office, medical, school, four of our six sites, we saw the same effluent concentration or an increase. In terms of TSS removal, here is the, the ranges that we saw. There's the expected range reported by the, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual. That is uh, MSM, that's the, the acronym up there. Um, two sites were within that range. One was pretty close. Uh, unfortunately, we had four sites that, uh, actually five, that reached all the way down to 0% removal with some storm events. Uh, you're gonna see throughout all of these pollutants, all of our constituents, that there's quite high variability in all of the data. 
Here's the median removal. So the stormwater manual reports 80%. We had uh, two sites, uh, animal and parking lot, where the median was fairly close, uh, but also four sites that were uh, much lower than what we would expect. Total phosphorus. Again, we're looking at influent first. That is the, the blue boxes. The MSM range is in the, within the dashed lines. So again, we're on the low side for influent. Affluent, uh, looking good, generally within the expected range, but uh, similar pattern, similar trend as to what we saw with TSS when you compare median influent to median effluent. We have animal, office, medical, parking lot, school, five or six sites where the median effluent is the same or more than influent. Here's our percent removal of TP. There's the range that we would expect from the MSM. Uh, we got three to four sites that, that at least there were some samples in that range, uh, but unfortunately there were also of those same four sites, we were also seeing 0% removal for some, some storm events. For percent median removal, we're hoping to get 50% removal uh, based on the stormwater manual. Uh, none of the median values reached that. We did have three sites at about 30, 35% but also three sites with the median of 0%. Let's look at total dissolved phosphorus and orthophosphorus then. Now, these are not a target of underground sand filter design. Uh, typically, designers will, there are uh, standards that designers are trying to hit with TSS and TP removal. Uh, it's acknowledged that total phosphorus or dissolved and ortho are not going to be removed. Um, let's, uh, so influent, I guess also here is the, for these two, the stormwater manual doesn't report expected influent or effluent concentrations. So there's uh, influent the boxes and effluent in the red. Again, we're seeing that trend continue with uh, animal, medical, parking lot, school, all where the effluent is greater than influent. We have two sites where there is some reduction, four sites where there's not. Total dissolved removal. Again, not, not expecting any here. Um, so it, not surprising, uh, kind of nice that we did, we did see two sites with providing some level of removal. And then uh, this is the median or expecting zero and kind of the same story there is that got a little bit. Orthophosphate, similar to total dissolved is there is not an expected uh, influent effluent concentration so you don't you won't see the um, dashed lines here but still a number of sites we have five out of the six where the effluent is larger than the influent concentration here's our percent op removal again not necessarily expected, not a target of these designs, but just generally curious to see what's happening with this constituent. And median removal, not expecting any, but getting a little bit something significant out of the office site. The last pollutant that we looked at was uh, E. coli. So we do have an expected range from the, the stormwater manual. Uh, again, this these are based on we looked in the stormwater manual at the, the, the land use types for all six of these sites. And based on those land uses, that's where this, that's how we, that's how we plotted this range on there. Um, influent, we got parking lot and school, which are in that range, office is low. 
animal apartment medical are all very high. Animal is likely due to just the operations at that particular site. It's uh, based on what they do there. It's very likely that they're small or maybe even large animals. They, I believe they have their own containment system to handle uh, those animals, but I'm sure there's probably some, uh, some excess that, that leaves that system. The apartment site, if you remember back to the aerial photo, the uh, system, the underground chamber system is located in a, a turfed area. So it wouldn't surprise me if uh, residents use that area to uh, recreate with their pets and you know what their pets would do. So that might be why that's higher medical. That's a hard one to explain. Um, maybe that is because of the, it's actually somewhat of a remote site, remote location. Um, possible that there are more critters than usual hanging out there. And there, there isn't any open water nearby, but maybe, maybe it's open enough and remote enough that there could be, you know, we, we caught some of those samples with a, a, you know, a goose invasion or something like that, perhaps. So our effluent concentrations, uh, this was the, of the five uh, pollutants that we looked at, this was certainly the most, uh, or the filters were most effective at reducing and removing E. coli. There you can see that with uh, the percent removal. So the stormwater manual is reporting 30 to 65 percent. We had four uh, four sites that that were were fairly effective. If we look at the removal median, uh, it's interesting uh, that the median in the stormwater manual is actually higher than the the range. But we did have uh, three sites, almost four, that that achieved that median. So let's take a step back, catch our breath. A lot of data. Um, we started this figure uh, with only color. I'm colorblind. I, uh, probably some of the folks in the audience are. So we add some arrows to make it even more, more apparent. What we're trying to do here is summarize uh, median influent to median effluent comparison. So if you see a red, rectangle or an up arrow that indicates that the effluent is greater than the influent, the median effluent greater than the median influent. We would hope to see more green than red. Uh, that did not turn out to be the case. Uh, the Again, most of these systems or I think probably all of these systems are really their intent is to reduce TSS and TP. Uh, they were marginal at best, uh, very, I would say, inconsistent in terms of how much they were removing and if they were removing at all. Total dissolved and ortho, uh, you can see in most sites, those were actually the filters served to be as sources of total and uh, dissolved. Sorry, total dissolved and ortho. The no change cells, we defined those just if the two medians, influent and effluent, were within 10% of each other. Uh, I guess the last thing that we monitored here was the filtration rate through the sand. Um, the stormwater manual doesn't report an expected filtration rate. Uh, but what many designers do is, I, I believe, use about one inch per hour, which corresponds to a, you know, a, a fairly good sandy soil. Uh, it turns out that we saw, uh, we were able to monitor four sites. I guess I'll start there. Uh, you see the results for the four sites. You don't see all six because uh, water levels within the office and school sites never actually increased. We never saw a bounce from the pressure transducers. Uh, office is fairly easy to explain. If you recall, uh, that one is comprised totally of, uh, of the larger aggregate, that there's, no, there's not a sand filter layer. So 
uh, for the storm events we monitored, it was essentially Q in equals Q out. The school site, however, was more uh, interesting. That is, uh, you know, that fits the bill. That's what we were looking for is that kind of site, uh, big perforated pipes with the sand layer below it. And uh, I'll, I'll show you here why, why we think that happened, but um, basically we, we never measured a filtration right there is that water coming into it went through the sand layer almost immediately. Uh, so we didn't record the water level in the system, but we also saw water coming from the drain tile. So we knew that it was plumbed correctly and water was moving through the system. So for these four sites where we did measure uh, rates, you can see the results there. Um, the parking lot site is our oldest site and that settles right around one inch per hour. So it seems like that assumption is pretty good for design. Uh, however, that's somewhat contrary to what you look at when you see the apartment site. Apartment, uh, animal, medical, those were all constructed in 2017, if you remember. So animal and medical seem to make sense. They're in that three to eight inch range. Apartment is much lower at about 0.2 inches per hour. Ah, another deep breath. All right, so what does all this mean? We looked at design variations. How does, uh, we tried to parse out our results and compare the results to the design details uh, within these sites. We looked at sand, the sand spec of the sand layer. We looked whether there is a sock around the drain tile. We looked at whether there was geotextile separating the storage layer from the sand filter. We looked at the drain tile size. Unfortunately, with those, we there were no substantial differences. And specifically for sock and geotextile, it's not so much that the data showed that, it's that of the six, there was only one site that had a sock around the drain tile and there was only one site that had geotextile between the sand and the storage layer. So drawing conclusions from only one site for those two, that, that there, there's not enough data there. So we didn't make any, any uh, conclusions or recommendations. What we did notice though was related to the frequency, I guess what I'm calling the frequency uh, or the prevalence of drain tile within these systems specifically the medical and school sites. Uh, if you recall, the, the medical site was the highest, that was the highest measured filtration rate. So that's three to eight inches per hour, along with the school site where we didn't measure any changes in water level. The thought here is that there may have been almost too much drain tile below the sand filter such that the, 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 the filter itself was not, uh, was coarse enough that water could go right through it and the drain tile was there to collect. Also with those two, the geometry was of a more square nature. So that's the column on the, the right, the system length to width ratio. Medical and school were fairly square systems so a perfectly square system would have a value of 1.0. Uh, compared to animal, which that had a much higher ratio, that was a much more rectangular system, very long and narrow. Uh, as we, we wanted to take a, a stab at the cost effectiveness of these systems as well. So there's some broad assumptions here. Uh, so bear with me, but it, it, this is an attempt to put these systems in perspective with their, with their effectiveness. So the six systems together, they total 64,000 cubic feet. Uh, on a broad basis, you could assume that it costs $20 per cubic foot to build the system. That's 1.3 million, but these systems do not only serve uh, for water quality. So we uh, cut that 1.3 million in half that 
they are being installed both for rate or flood control along with water quality. So let's, we'll assign $650,000 to the water quality cost. Then to gauge the, uh, the removal, we assume one pound total phosphorus per impervious acre, 30 year system life. And we get down to $17,000 per pound of phosphorus removal. So there are definitely, there's plenty of assumptions in there, but we're looking for a ballpark number. Even if uh, our assumptions are, are off by a bit, still with, if you think of that as a range of, let's say 10 to $20,000 per pound phosphorus removal, that cost is on the very high end. And that, that removal is based on the, the overall median that we saw from all six systems. So that's on the very high end. Um, on the, you know, probably even exceeding a, a standalone stormwater retrofit project. Uh, that type of project could be in the, you know, maybe five to ten thousand dollars per pound. Um, and also this, this calculation doesn't include maintenance costs. So let's try to distill all this down uh, and make some conclusions and recommendations. So we did that by separating positive outcomes to negative. We'll start with uh, effluent TSS and TP. So uh, we noted those uh, early on in the presentation. We have four, almost five uh, of the six sites where the affluent TSS is within the MSM range, similar to affluent TP, five of six within the range. And uh, the, we got two asterisks there, two stars to uh, just understand that we're totally aware that at low influent concentrations, it's very hard to reduce it even further. Um, so we recognize that, that expecting the uh, percent removals uh, may not be realistic. Having said that, per, the percent TP removal did, it, at least for some samples, it did ex extend into the, the MSM expected range. Lastly, three of the six sites did achieve that filtration rate of about one inch per hour. Negative outcomes. Uh, negative side uh, largely focuses on the affluent concentrations. And you can see those uh, listed up there at the top, those four. TSS, TP, total dissolved OP. Either four or five of the six sites, the median concentrations increased. The ramifications of that are, we put a lot of time, effort, money into these systems. And to some degree, the systems are making, could be making downstream uh, water bodies worse. They are, uh, could be adding to downstream algae blooms. TSS removal. So we did see some positive results there. You know, we had the range up to 95, we had the median up to 72, but there were still a number of sites where there was 0% removal. Four of six sites, the median TSS was 30% or less. Similar with percent TP removal, some samples, four of six sites, that range was extending down to 0%. In terms of filtration rate, uh, one of those four that we measured, that was the apartment site, that did not achieve that. Again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but uh, just, a, a, I think, probably a design uh, assumption of one inch per hour, and filtration rates were not measurable at two of six sites. Uh, not surprisingly, those two sites were also also yielded the lowest TSS removals, as well as two of the three lowest TP removals. So let's bring this all together with some recommendations. Uh, number one here is design modifications to improve pollutant removal. Uh, 1A, so designers should consider, should include human access to inlets, outlets, top of the system sand layer. So this goes back to 
way at the beginning of our research study of where we identified a system to monitor, but we couldn't actually monitor it because we didn't have great access. If we don't have access to monitor, the owner certainly isn't going to know uh, how, it, how the system is performing, uh, if it's performing, or when to, when to uh, uh, perform maintenance. 1B, uh, all of these systems, or these six that we looked at, could be called a buried sand filter. If you recall back to the, uh, the typical designs that I showed at the beginning, the sand layer is located below the storage system. And alternative to that would be to locate the sand layer within the invert or at the invert or at the bottom of the storage system. Uh, I don't make this suggestion uh, promising better gluten removal. We did not evaluate any such system, but perhaps there would be a benefit of having the, the, the sand layer exposed to air. Now, again, that's not necessarily at the surface. There's, there's still some maybe dead air down there, but it certainly would be more accessible for maintenance. 1C is to consider a filter amendment. I don't have any specific recommendations there, only uh, cautions, I guess, is because some amendment choices have been shown to leach phosphorus and uh, one particular iron filings, if, if you wanna consider those, that may not be effective because being in an underground environment, there may be low oxygen that wouldn't allow the filings to oxidize between storm events. 1D is to scrap the sand filter idea altogether and place a manufactured treatment device downstream of your storage system. That is probably a whole another discussion in and of itself, but something to be considered. 1E is to implement multiple layers, multiple types of pretreatment. So as I noted, uh, there was increases in total dissolved and ortho in most of the sites. Uh, I don't know this for sure. We did not uh, observe. We didn't see the, the bottom of the pipe systems. We didn't enter any of the systems, but uh, I, I would imagine that there's probably some leaves or grass clippings, woody debris that is uh, maybe decomposing there and, and leading to the leaching of, of some of those nutrients. With multiple layers of pretreatment, uh, sumps, multiple sumps, uh, baffle devices, swirl separators, using multiple, you might be able to target a different range of those, uh, of that sort of debris. One F is considering multiple cells or filter cells rather than just one big system. Um, I haven't seen this done. So again, I can't um, promise or, or say with any uh, confidence that it would be better, but perhaps there's an upper cell that filters water and the drain tile in that cell leads to a, a downstream, a second cell, a second filter. And then 1G is to evaluate the frequency of drain tile. That gets back to the, the school and the medical sites where it certainly seemed like the, the, the frequency having more drain tile was leading to less pollutant removal. Five or four more recommendations here. So with all this being said, um, our recommendation is to use these systems with caution. Uh, certainly there's, we sampled six sites, 20 storms. Uh, in terms of research and monitoring, you can always say that more data is better. Uh, that could certainly be the case here. More data may show that they're more effective, but based on what we're seeing, uh, it's, uh, uh, proceed with caution. Certainly, number three, continue to educate designers and owners on the need for maintenance. Number four, include drain tile as an outlet in the computer model of calculations. Again, I guess I think a lot of time with designs, we will uh, simulate, we'll model, we'll calculate the runoff into the storage of these systems, include a filtration rate as one of the outlets, but ignore the drain tile below the filter, below that sand layer. Uh, 
my suggestion here is to route the water that's moving through the filter layer into your drain to that system. And lastly, uh, continue research on, on these systems. Uh, I noted the, the number of systems, the number of storm events. Uh, the systems are popular. So if, uh, if, if there's interest for designers to continue to use them, um, of course, more data is always better. A uh, suggestion through that process would be, is there, uh, should there be additional sizing criteria? So if, if these systems continue, uh, should we be looking at them? Should we be designing them a different way than the surface counterparts? So I've talked for too long here. Uh, thanks for your patience. And also thank you to the research team, uh, Allie, Lou, and Jeff. Uh, the internal review team, Ed, Diane, Dendy, thank you, all six of you for your assistance. Site owners, if any of you are listening in, thank you for your cooperation. And finally, thanks to the, the Research Council for funding this investigation. With that, I'll turn it to Maggie to navigate questions. I'm sure there are none, so we can probably just wrap this up quickly, right? <laughs> you don't get off so easy, Dad. Uh, well, thanks for that great presentation. It looks like we have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, just a reminder to like or click on the thumbs up if you like the question, which will bring it to the top. We'll be answering the most popular questions first. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like they're all easy ones, Todd. So this, this should be no problem. Um, the first one is, did your sampling include water that bypassed the filter? Uh, we would have loved to, but in the storm events that we monitored, we did not observe any bypass, as well as the, the water levels that we recorded didn't indicate for those storm events that there was any bypass. All right, your next question is, what is the range of sand depth in the various sand filters studied? Oh, ho, ho. you know, you always prepare those extra slides and you never use them. Here we go. So there's the range of the sand filter depth. Uh, it looks like we had three with 18 inches and two with 24 inches. All right. Uh, next question is, were the system residence times accounted for when timing the sampling at each system's inlet and outlet? Outlet sample taken once residence time after the inlet sample. No uh, good idea. We didn't get to that, those level of specifics. It was more so uh, trying to track the, the storm, or trying to match the storm track with the sites uh, and where, for the most part, where Alley was coming from, uh, trying to make it the most efficient, the most efficient tour among the six sites. Your next question is, did filtration rates have any correlation with the pollution or pollutant removals of the site? Um, E.g., did higher infiltration rates have less pollutant removals? Uh, we saw those trends for the, the two sites where we couldn't, uh, where we didn't see any water levels and pressure transducers. So office and school uh, were very low performers for TSS and TP. The other sites uh, we looked, but there weren't any significant trends between uh, um, the other four where we did measure the filtration rates. All right, next question is, where do you think the extra TSS is coming from? Did you inspect the systems at the start of the sampling? Was there accumulated debris in the systems? Um, Good question. There, there was accumulated debris in a number of the pretreatment sumps. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking, I mean, I guess just as an aside, there were a couple sumps where there was uh, a hood or a baffle installed. And just by observation uh, for designers, those, those devices seem to be very effective in that, um, in those applications. 
And again, during our sampling, uh, if you recall, at least the two sites that we got a response on maintenance, there was no maintenance that occurred during our sampling. So that's, that's a good point. Some of that TSS could have been sneaking through as it was, as it had been captured in the upstream sumps that could have been loading our systems beyond just what was coming from the storm events. In terms of what was in the storage systems themselves, again, we did not get in, we did not inspect or observe uh, what was in, what was laying in the bottom of those systems. Here's a good question from Mike Trojan. Uh, the stormwater manual guidance doesn't distinguish between above and below ground systems. Do you feel like underground systems merit separate consideration in the manual? Oh boy. Um, I would say based on this data, it makes me rethink that. Uh, again, I, I don't want to go too far to eliminate an option from designers, but uh, especially with the, the, co the estimated cost and the effectiveness, it just makes me think of how can we be just as a you know the stormwater community how can we be spending that money more more efficiently to to accomplish better removals all right next question is when calculating the load removal what concentration values did you use for the pollutants do you use a flow weighted average time weighted average or something else um so i guessing that that question came from our the cost effectiveness calculation i didn't want to get too too much in the weeds i didn't want to go too far with that calculation there were enough assumptions already so that i did not actually use the loading or the the concentration data from these sites uh, instead we used this uh, one pound per impervious acre of phosphorus loading and then the median percent removal from all six sites. Uh, I realized that we, we could have taken, we could have used the individual site data, and, but I didn't, because we were using grab samples, I just didn't want to take that data too far and make it mean more than, than what it could. Um, I think if we were to do that, you would find that the, the runoff would have probably been less than one, eight, one pound per acre, such that the systems would have removed less. And then that cost effect, that number would have been even higher. So I think we're, it's still, even though it's a ballpark, it still feels like it's a conservative ballpark. Great, next question is, uh, I'm curious if you completed a ratio of orthophosphate to dissolves phosphorus for the info at your sites. Sampling both is unusual, but needed as we move to phosphate control. Uh, good question. I don't think that we did that. Uh, Allie is on the line. Allie, do you know if we did that? Oops. We did not complete that ratio. We just used the three different um, phosphate series and analyze those. Okay. Thanks, Allie. Thanks, Allie. Uh, next question is how does expected volume control affect the mass balance and removal percentages? Well, uh, I've heard, so volume control is not necessarily expected with these sites. Uh, there is, there's, e there's likely minimal infiltration because that, that's the reason why these sites are doing filtration as it is, is because the, the existing soils, there's either problem, there, there's contamination or uh, poor infiltration. So volume control, there's probably not much of the pollutants that are uh, infiltrating into the ground. There is some that will be uh, captured, not maybe not captured, but, but will be retained within that sand filter layer. 
that probably is only between storm events though, because as soon as you get another event, that's water is just gonna flush that through and down the system. All right, next question is, designs in our city tend to be side by side sediments and sand chambers, both above ground and underground. Do those not exist in Minnesota? Um, side by side, what was it? Sediment in sand? Yeah, yes. I don't, sorry, go ahead, Megan. Uh, yep, side by side sediment and sand chambers. It, you know, as I picture that description, I can't think of any that I've seen in Minnesota. Um, I, I am familiar with, there are some details, there are some designs, I, I think within the, the stormwater manual that are similar, or that sound similar, but those systems don't seem to be as popular in Minnesota um, for, for whatever reason. Now, they're probably, similar to some of these designs where you have uh, either the pipe or the chamber can sometimes uh, be considered the pretreatment for these systems. So there's a, a weir in these systems that pushes the first flush into a dedicated row. And then that row is the focus of, of pretreatment and sediment. So that, that maybe that's a, a parallel to those that system that the um, the question asks. All right, next question is, did you work um, to identify any groundwater mounding or review pre-designed soil borings and groundwater assumptions? No, we did not do that. Uh, reasonable question. I don't, um, again, there's kind of a, inherent assumption that the original design and the review agencies would have accounted for that either with either checking that groundwater wasn't an issue or that there is a liner uh, to appropriately separate the system from a high groundwater condition. I don't recall any sites where there was a well, again, I guess we've been there in dry time. So I was thinking if there were any sites where we saw a constant or even in dry conditions where we saw water coming out of the ground or coming out of the drain tile. Um, so no, we, we didn't look at it, but I think the, we assumed that it would have been looked at previously by, uh, by others. Great. Uh, next question is a clarification question. Um, were both inlet and outlet samples taken via grab sampling? Yes, they were taken by grab. See, that was an easy one. <laughs> All right. The next question is, uh, my first question relates to the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, which states, in this design, the sand filter is placed in a three-chambered underground vault accessible by manholes or grate openings. Appendix D clearly shows a vault structure with the media housed inside the structure and has been included in the manual since at least 2005. Um, and then his question is, why has this guidance, why, or maybe what might be, why was this guidance inconsistent with what has been permitted and installed? Uh, yeah, that I'm, I'm aware of that. Can, I'm getting some feedback. Do I sound good now? Okay, that, never mind. Sorry, it's gone. Uh, yes, I'm aware of that that design, that detail. Uh, I don't know why that doesn't get used more frequently. That is a, a different variety sand filter than what we than what we studied. Uh, it's my hunch, my guess is that the the footprint of that particular design is small enough that it doesn't allow enough uh, flow through the system. So that, that that particular structure is the limiting factor in, in the design. 
with these particular systems, the footprint of the sand filter is much larger, so you can just push more water through the system. All right, so our next question is, what about other additives that have other covalent cautions than iron, like aluminum, magnesium, or calcium? Activated alumina or aluminum-based water treatment residuals have been shown to be particularly effective at removing dissolved phosphorus. Uh, yeah, that's when I get the punt on that answer, and uh, I'll, I'll kick that over to Andy Erickson, and he can, he can take that from here for a, a future, future webinar. Um, certainly, uh, I would say investigate all of those options. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know the, the benefit or risk of, of any of those off the top of my head, though. All right, we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, next one is, were there any observations of goals at the medical site? Not that I remember hearing. Uh, Allie, did you happen to get chased by a swarm of gulls or crows, geese, anything at the medical center? No gulls. I did not see any gulls. There were rabbits observed, uh, but no okay. birds. All right. Well, maybe we'll end it at that one. Um, and for all the participants, we will be sending out all of your questions to Todd and Satoshi for additional follow-up. So the last two questions were answered will be answered shortly. Um, and let's see. So I just want to give like a round of applause, a virtual applause to both of you. And thank you for sharing your work today. I am just going to be placing a survey in the chat here. Um, this uh, survey is gonna help us um, tailor future research spotlights to better meet your needs. So please do take five minutes to, to fill that out for us. Um, also wanted to mention again that all the, of the past presentations, including this one, is gonna be available on the YouTube channel, which is listed there. You can also find that link on our website. And then just a quick reminder again of the upcoming seminaries on February 24th with David McCarthy. We hope that you join us for that. So thank you all of you again for joining us for this research spotlight and please have a great rest of your day.